Yesterday, while looking out this balcony over the Boston Common, I watched the much-anticipated solar eclipse showcasing over the Boston Common. Besides the beauty of these two heavenly bodies aligning perfectly every 20 years from this vantage point and then casting these momentary shadows in our world, the most interesting part of this whole experience, for me at least, personally, was coming to terms with this precision by which we humans are capable of predicting the exact time, location, and duration of an actual total eclipse somewhere in the world, exactly where it's going to happen and how it's going to happen and how long it's going to last. Furthermore, we also know that this information years in advance and based on our calculations so that we know that this exact same thing is going to happen once again exactly 20 years from now. This level of certainty in predictions is really remarkable and what makes science the amazing tool that it is and why all of us in the healthcare field love and study science. Now, for those of us who watched the recent Netflix series, The Three-Body Problem, which is based on a science fiction novel by Xi Xin Liu, who is a, um, a Chinese author, uh, you guys may have heard about the Newton's three body problem. For those of you who haven't heard about this thing, the three-body problem, let me just explain it for a second. Isaac Newton, that all of us know is a 17th century physicist that we all love and respect, a guy who invented calculus and defined the orbital motion of heavenly bodies in space. Well, he realized over 300 years ago that the gravitational pull and interactions of motion between two heavenly bodies can be calculated with extreme precision using or motion equations at that time. But as soon as you add a third body or more than three, the gravitational motion between all these three bodies or more becomes extremely chaotic and unpredictable as the number of variables gets out of hand in our equations. This was actually demonstrated in our solar system back in 2009 by a couple of researchers who uh, basically ran two thousand computer simulations of the motion of our solar system planets from their current position in the solar system over the next five billion years by only changing the position of Mercury's orbit by less than a millimeter each time. They were shocked to find out that this little tiny change in the orbit of, of Mercury resulted into some of the simulations being completely destabilizing the entire solar system, and then another ones causing Mercury to crash into the Sun or into Venus. The three-body problem, or also the, called the end-body problem, such as the one that you see in our solar system, for example, these are inherently unpredictable systems in the long run because the multifactorial equations that are needed to solve these motion uh, problems have so many variables that we just do not know. And this, of course, is why biological beings like the weather are difficult to study and predict uh, because of the fact that they're all multifactorial. This is also why all scientific experiments need controls for confounding factors and the variance in order to address the role of air that mounts. Now, we try to increase the power of our studies by increasing the sample size and also add controls. And if the experimental design that we put together is poor, the results will be unpredictable. And since science is all about finding ways to explain phenomenon, the um, accuracy uh, of the results that we end up getting from these poorly designed experiments also become questionable when we just don't account for all of the factors in these multifactorial problems. Since I occasionally do dabble in a little bit into the uh, endodontic literature and also do a little, you know, some of the videos for you guys on this topic and also run the occasional current lit seminar for our postdocs and residents. This irreproducibility of many endodontic articles that have similar designs but end up having conflicting results has not escaped my mind. Science is all about predictions and if our scientific articles often tend to have conflicting uh, results, uh, then we sometimes have to wonder who's right and who's wrong in some of these studies. I mean, these articles would should probably instead be published in the Journal of Irreproducible Science rather than the Journal of Endodontics. Part of the problem here, of course, is that all healthcare is like Newton's three-body problem, and the multifactorial components of disease and treatment failures may 
be way too much for us to control in simple benchtop or proxy experiments that we tend to run all the time in our kind of literature. Maybe instead of more research, we actually need less research, but higher quality research. Maybe uh, my proposal that I did in one of the videos for you guys of having our you know, higher body professional institutions actually hire professional researchers that are non-biased and non-commercial to run high power clinical trials uh, would be really the only way for us to ever find approximate answers to the truth in our field. Anyway, instead of complaining about the folks at the JOE and IEJ, maybe well, we should take a quick look at the big picture of endodontic science and say, what is it that we really all agree on across the board? What is really not controversial in any way? And to be honest, there are so many opinions shared by so many key opinion leaders out there in our field. And now you add to that social media and everyone's voice, it's really a good idea to bring it down to the most basic things we all agree on as a whole and not have any controversial topics here. The problem, of course, is that when we all look deep into the literature, we realize that there is really broad areas of discord, but there are also areas of broad agreement. The reality of the matter is that the one and perhaps only universal piece of science that we all agree on is that the cause of endodontic disease is microbial. Yes, it's bacterial, fungus, viruses, and other antigenic byproducts that cause inflammation. Now, these get into the root canal system through caries, cracks, trauma, or other potential ways, but ultimately cause a disease and symptoms that require our attention. We also know that all things being equal, necrotic cases fare much worse than vital cases and outcomes, and finding old canals and better disinfection in general or as a rule, is associated with better outcomes. But we still don't know how much is really enough. After all, you can kill a fly with a shotgun or a fly swatter and it's the same results. For us, like many other areas of life, the question really here is, where do we draw a line? How much instrumentation and disinfection is enough and how much is too much? I mean, we're we gonna weaken the tooth, are we wasting time? There is really a lot of questions here that we still don't know at the present time what the answer to them are. But the good news here, before I get too cynical, is that uh, we know that root canal therapy, when done correctly, works and can be predictable the majority of times. And when it doesn't work, then we can find out through some good follow-up care and also recall and can then employ some other mitigating procedures such as revision and surgery to still have a certain percentage of those kinds of cases that didn't work the first time around still saved. So whether you should use nighttime files, use a specific brand of files, a burrs, you know, hand files, use lasers or sound energy, or even use a specific type of sealer, it's all speculation and perhaps mostly clinical conveniences, such as things that improve your efficiency or are kind of lower cost, if you will. And the donic success and failure are multifactorial problems, and we often don't have all the factors nor all the answers yet. This is why we make decisions based on what makes sense to us, both clinically and theoretically. And as long as we use a patient's first approach, we can continue to provide this invaluable service to our patients and save their teeth for as long as possible. Anyway, let me know what you guys think that I potentially have left out here as a fundamental uh, point to um, the question of outcomes and results and what we know and we don't know. And what specific piece of science do you guys really think we critically need to answer this multifactorial puzzle that we call endodontic disease? Leave your comments below this video here, and let's get into a conversation on the topic as a community. In the meantime, and as usual, don't forget to like and subscribe and also to hit that notification bell. And I'll see you guys all in the next video.